Welcome to the second Community Mental Health Drug and Alcohol Research Network Reflective Practice Webinar. My name is Deb Tipper and I'm the Project Officer for the Research Network. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the tra traditional owners of the land on which this meeting is hosted, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. I'd also like to acknowledge and value the lived experience of people recovering from either mental distress or drug and alcohol issues. Today we're again looking at an issue of great importance, that of substance use amongst consumers of the drug and alcohol service. The journal article discussing the research was recently published in the journal Mental Health and Substance Use. I thank Adam Zimmerman, the lead researcher and co-author of the article, for his involvement in today's webinar. We're particularly pleased to be highlighting this research as it was funded through a Mental Health Coordinating Council and Network of Alcohol and Other Drug Agencies Mental Health and Drug and Alcohol Research Grants Initiative, funded by New South Wales Health. This initiative was one of the stepping stones towards the establishment of the research network. Two other articles which discuss research similarly funded by the initiative were published in the same journal whilst the International Journal of Mental Health and Addiction has published other work funded through this initiative. We're very proud to be involved in supporting these pieces of research. These reflective practice webinars are designed to provide you with a chance to assess, discuss and analyse recent and relevant research and to consider how the findings of the research may impact on the work you do. Please take the opportunity during the webinar to ask questions. There's also a short questionnaire as you leave the webinar, which I'd appreciate you completing in order to assist in our planning of future events. For your colleagues who missed the chance to participate, they'll be able to view the webinar online. We'll post the link onto the Community Mental Health Drug and Alcohol Research Network website. We're very fortunate to have as our facilitator, Dr. Catherine Mills, Senior Lecturer in National Health and Medical Research Fellow at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre at the New South Wales University. Catherine's also a member of the Project Reference Group for the Research Network and it's with great pleasure I now pass you over to Catherine. Thanks Deb and welcome everybody to our second webinar and welcome Adam, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, just to... Um, reiterate what Deb, Deb was saying, that the purpose of these webinars that we're having is to uh, help participants to be able to read publications critically and appraise their value in terms of informing clinical practice. So today um, we're very fortunate to have Adam talking to us about the article that he recently published with his co-authors. So he'll be focusing on uh, outlining areas that are important in the process of critically appraising a publication, like the purpose of the research, the methods used, uh, interpreting the results, and then what the implications of those results are for clinical practice. And then after he's given that presentation, we'll have uh, a lot of time to discuss um, and answer questions about the article that people may have. So please feel free to um, send through to us and you can send those questions through at any time during Adam's presentation but we won't be answering them until the end. Um, and that's about it from me I think. So I'd just like to introduce Adam, uh, Adam Zimmerman who is the research coordinator at NEMI and he's responsible for many of the organisation's internal research and evaluation activities. Uh, he also plays a key role in overseeing external research projects that are being conducted within NEMI. Before moving into the field of mental health research, Adam worked in various social work and strategic development roles. He has a Bachelor of Health Science and a TAFE qualification in project management and is currently completing his Masters of Public Health. So thank you very much, Adam. Well, thank you. Um, all right, thank, hi everyone. Um, I've got this presentation, presentation today uh, that's going to outline a study that we at NEMI completed in 2009. So as Kath um, Catherine said it is going to be focusing on why we did the study, what we found, um, some of the methodology and uh, about what these findings mean for NEMI and also in relation to um, what they mean in the context of other mental health research that's been done. So I'm going to start the presentation today with a, a poll that um, will come up, you'll see some questions come up shortly 
And these questions are about um, some of the assumptions that we had when we went into the study. So I'm just interested to see what you guys as participants of this um, presentation today think. And um, if you've read the article, you may already have seen the, the answers to these questions. But just to see if people are thinking the same as what um, we were thinking when we went into the study. So if Todd's able to put those up now. So there's three questions. I'm going to put them up just for roughly 10, 15 seconds at a time. So just it's a very simple question. Whatever you think. So if you wanted to put the second question up. So the aim is that as we go through the presentation, you'll get a chance to see if your assumption about these answers were, um, these questions were correct or not, and in line um, with what we thought as well when we started the study. So there's one final question that I think um, we've got to put up as well. This is the last one. And as you can see, the, the types of things that we thought um, uh, things that are very widely reported in a lot of research in relation to rates of substance use amongst people with a mental illness and about their um, attitudes and thoughts about um, things like tobacco smoking. So um, it seems that a lot of people uh, are thinking very similar um, to what we were thinking. So I'll proceed with the presentation now. I just thought that would be an interesting way to see um, some of the thoughts are that you had. So um, as Deb, Deb mentioned, the study was conducted using funds provided by the, the NGO Mental Health and Drug and Alcohol Research Grants Program, which was administered through the New South Wales Department of Health. Um, one of our key reasons for wanting to do this study was that there was a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of literature which reports on high rates of substance use amongst people who have a serious mental illness. and from our perspective, a lot of that research has been conducted primarily in clinical settings. So we wanted to conduct this study to get a sense of are these findings relevant and are they the same for, for people who um, live in the community and receive their primary means of uh, mental health support through a community um, mental health agency. So the first thing was about gathering detailed data on substance use, which we didn't actually have beforehand. The second aim um, which allowed us to achieve that was to introduce routine drug and alcohol screening and we'll talk a bit about the methodology later on but one of the things yeah, was about introducing a, a tool that would collect the primary data for the study but then that would then become routine practice afterwards. The third sort of aim was uh, to get a, a sense of how we could build capacity of, of the organisation to respond more effectively to coexisting issues of mental health and substance use. And so the aim of gathering the detailed data about rates of substance use would then help to inform um, what we need to do as an organisation to then um, more, act more proactively support people who have identified as having coexisting issues. So as I said, that was sort of um, the background that I was touching on and the aims of the study as well, measure the prevalence and impact of substance use. An additional aim which wasn't reported on in the article that we wrote was to administer a, an audit throughout the organisation to determine what was it, where was our skill set in relation to working with people who had coexisting issues of mental health and substance use. So I'll, I'll speak about the findings of that a bit later on. So for those who aren't aware of NEMI, we're a national community-based mental health organisation and at the time of conducting this study in 2009 we had uh, 22 service sites which were located across the country and all active consumers, so people who were um, currently receiving support from our workers were invited to take part in the study. 
So all participants, um, once they gave informed consent, were then asked to complete the ASSIST, which is the Alcohol, Smoking and Substance Involvement Screening Test, with their um, support worker. And if they were identified as a smoker through this um, initial administration of the ASSIST, they were then asked to complete a specific tobacco questionnaire. Another aspect of the study that wasn't reported in the most recent article, which was reported in uh, the International Journal of Mental Health and Addiction, was participants who are aged under 30 were also asked to complete the K10 and the LSP16. And this was because in our initial application for funds, that was our sort of primary target audience for the study, but then a very low proportion of people who access NEMI are under 30, so then we extended the study more broadly. And as I said, all staff from the 22 sites participated in this organisational capacity audit using the COMPASS, which is the Comorbidity Program Audit and Self-Survey. And that was done by myself and some fellow colleagues from across the country, and we still had a focus group within uh, various teams. So that's the sort of the rough methodology that we adopted. And just going to the next slide. So this is the, the group of people that we then recruited into the study. We were fairly pleased with our sample of 489 people who were then um, who were, who took part in the study. This represented an approximate response rate of 42%, which is fairly um, fairly representative. But ideally, more more participants would have been better. Uh, as you can see, there was a slight um, slight increase in the amount of males compared to females, slightly larger amount. And as you can see with the breakdown, uh, the majority of people who um, took part in the study had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And that is a reflection of the, the rates of um, people more broadly who receive support from NEMI. The majority of those do have a uh, diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, we collected in our demographic sort of information sheet, we collected a, a lot of inf a range of information about the person themselves, their indigenous status, how long they received support from NEMI, and that's all presented in the, the paper itself. But the majority of people had, um, well, 40% have received roughly one to three years of support from NEMI. And of what we thought was particularly interesting, that only 7.5% of the sample as a whole had a link currently to an AOD service. Um, the majority, unfortunately, the way that we set up the demographic sheet, we weren't able to work out the exact average age of participants because we collected information based on different categories. But the majority of people fell within um, the 25 to 44 age bracket. So what we found is that the lifetime use rates, so people who have ever used a substance was fairly high, roughly 75% of people who completed the assist um, had rated that they hadn't used one substance at one point in their life. And when we get into, um, I think it's the next slide, you can get a sense of what substances the assist actually screens for. What was interesting is that we found that there was high rates of people who had a strong urge or desire to use cannabis and alcohol on a daily basis than what they actually use. So there's a question on the assist which asks about how often do you use a particular substance and there's a subsequent question which asks how do you have a strong urge or desire to use this substance and it seemed the pattern was that people were reporting a strong urge or desire but weren't using it at that same rate. We found that males tended to show higher risk levels associated with their use of cannabis and alcohol um, and I'll speak a bit more about some of the other patterns that we found in relation to substance use as we go along. So one of the, the most interesting things about this study was in the assist, um, for those who have used it before, there's a, a column at the end which asks about other, other substances and of other substances, caffeine is one of those that's then asked about in administering the assist. So what we found is that nearly 25% of people who uh, participated and said that they had their caffeine use had caused them some problems in the past. So that was on a, a scale of 
may have only been once or twice, or may have been daily or almost daily, and that may just be something that they are spending a lot of money on caffeinated drinks, or that it was then had an effect upon their health, maybe their weight, maybe their. Um, well, we had a lot of reports of that it does impact upon the amount of um, times people go to the toilet in the day. So there was things like that. We found also that was of interest is that over 25% of respondents reported that a friend or relative had expressed concern over their caffeine use in the past. So this is giving an indication that um, people are potentially or were using caffeine at exceptionally high levels if someone has commented and made a um, expressed concern about their use of caffeine. There were also and, uh, nearly 30% of participants who said that at some point in the past they had previously trialed tried and failed or had an unsuccessful attempt at cutting down or controlling or stopping uh, their use of caffeine. <coughs> so as you can see here, this is the table which represents all the substances that are screened for using the assist. So tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, ATS stands for amphetamines, uh, amphetamine type stimulants, inhalants, sedatives, hallucinogens, opioids, in other and with other there is a few other substances that are screened for such as um, a fantasy or GHB is one that's in there but we found through the administering the system the, people, the sport workers who were completing the form were noting on the form that it was caffeine primarily um, when other substance was identified um, so this, that's what we've reported there so as you can see um, for um, the rates of of use um, once or twice uh, means exactly that once or twice in a three month it's the assist screen is for a three month period um, so monthly is one to three times per month weekly is they use the substance one to four times per week and daily would be using the substance five to seven times per week um, of particular interest that stands out is the high rate of smoking so 60 roughly 65 percent of the sample smoked on a daily basis and this is Comparing to the 2010 National Drug Strategy Household, household Survey, um, that was I think 17% of the daily of the population were reported as daily smokers in that survey. Um, you can see things in relation to frequency of alcohol use, um, and that again was something that was particularly interesting because in comparing to a survey of people in the general population, um, it was. People in the general population reported using alcohol, or um, well 7.2% of people reported using it daily, and 39.5% reported using it weekly. So there is a fairly high proportion, nearly 43% 40, of people who said they never had consumed alcohol in the past three months. Um, the other thing, the other substance, ca cannabis, there rates were. Um, a bit less than what we'd thought, and again, thinking in comparison to this survey, which we we compared to the um, the the national drug strategy national drug strategy household survey, we saw that um, rates of cannabis use were less in this sample than had been reported in that survey. Um, so that was something that was interesting to us, and as you can see, rates of substance use across most of the or the other illicit substances identified are fairly non-existent. So in terms of sedative use, uh, that is deemed as using a sedative that is um, outside of the range of their prescription. So they may have a prescription, but it's outside of that, that range. And so um, that's probably the, the substance there that was um, of most concern, but people using cocaine or opioids or amphetamines was relatively low all around. So this next slide presents a, a summary of falling into abuse and dependence categories. So the assist ranks people <coughs> ranks people's scores of their responses to the questions on the assist and gives it a, a score. And so if you have a score between um, four to twenty six for all the substances except alcohol, you would fall into an abuse category. And if you have a, a score of twenty seven and above you would fall into a dependence category. And with the assist, there's different rankings for different responses. So um, it, I think the assist is a widely available document. So I think if you haven't seen it, um, it's 
make a bit more sense to have a quick look at that um, to get a sense of how different questions are weighted. So as you can see, there's an exceptionally high portion of people who fall into abuse, uh, the abuse category, nearly 92% of the sample, um, and a relatively high amount as well that falls into the dependence category. If you control for um, caffeine in that sort of um, analysis, the rate for um, the overall rate then drops to 65.6% .6 for abuse and 32.1% for dependence. And if you're looking at um, just for illicit substances, the rate then drops significantly down to 36.6% um, and to 8.6% for dependence. So that's taking out um, tobacco and uh, caffeine and alcohol there, and it significantly has a, a big impact upon the overall rates of depend abuse and dependence. Um, and what what we did find, and I'll roughly t briefly talk about that later, is that people who had a psychotic disorder um, were sort of slightly higher in each of their uh, risk categories for all of the substances identified. <coughs> so this um, next slide presents an overview of what, when you complete the assist, you get what's known as a specific substance involvement score, and that is the, the total score for uh, the substance. And so as I said, if it's between 4 and 26, it's abuse, and 27, and I think it goes up to roughly in the 40, high 40s, if you answered the, the score, the question with the highest score for each of the, um, the questions, you'll see that um, the substances that, of, that scored highest were tobacco and caffeine, and the substances that are highlighted there in yellow, alcohol, cannabis, and hallucinogens, that's indicating that we did a, a t-test on those and males had a significantly higher score than females for those substances. Um, but as you can see, in the, in the range of uh, what would fall into the abuse category, being 4 to 26, the majority of the, the scores there are exceptionally low and it's only tobacco and caffeine that are anywhere that's um, significantly higher than the other, the other substances there. So as I mentioned before, of people who identified on the assist as being a, a smoker of tobacco, they were then asked to complete a, um, a specific questionnaire that we developed, and this was um, because we wanted to get a sense of how um, people's attitudes and beliefs towards tobacco and get more of a detailed sense about the amounts that they smoke. The one limitation of the assist is it talks about frequency of use. It doesn't actually give any details about quantities. So with this questionnaire, we're able to specifically focus on what people, how much people were smoking. And as you can see, people who smoke, which is 65% of the sample, a very large portion of those smoke um, quite a lot. Majority smoke between 11 and uh, 30 cigarettes per day. And there's even some who are smoking um, between 31 and 50 and a few who identified as smoking more than 50 cigarettes per day. Obviously, smoking that many cigarettes has a significant impact upon the amount of money that people spend on cigarettes. And as you can see, um, the majority of people are spending between um, 50 and a, uh, between 20 and 100 dollars. But yeah, roughly, uh, nearly uh, over 40 percent are spending between 51 and 100 dollars per week. And that, for a group of people who um, are on a, a high likelihood of being on a disability support pension, that's a significant amount of their money each week that's being um, put towards smoking cigarettes. So that was something that was of particular concern to us as an agency. The questionnaire then also asked a few detailed questions about some of their thoughts about tobacco and the, um, their attitudes and beliefs about it. And interestingly, there was a very, very high portion uh, 80, over 80% 80 of people say that smoking helps them cope with life and 75% um, said it helps to cope with loneliness. So that was on a range of uh, little to extremely, but it still gets a sense that um, it's a very high portion of people who say that it's playing that support role in their life for them. Um, despite the high rate of people who smoke, we found that we asked a question about um, intention to quit or any sort of thoughts about making changes to their smoking behaviour. And as you can see, over 70% of people expressed a, no, a desire to either quit or reduce the amount of tobacco they were then smoking. 
So what that meant for us as an, as an organization, we wanted to know then, do they believe that Neymar should be playing an active role in helping to support people reduce their smoking if they wish? And you can see there that 70% of people did believe that was the case. Of concern for us and something that helped, has helped to inform some of the strategies that we've done to work with um, smoking cessation groups is that there is still a third, there was a third of people who believe that smoking um, had an improving factor upon their mental health. We also asked the question about what are some of the factors that make it difficult for you to cut down. People stated that being around other people who smoke made it particularly difficult for them to think about cutting down. The cost of um, particular nicotine replacement therapies and having, in line with that last um, point there, having a concern about the impact of quitting and that, what that might do for their mental health was a concern. Um, stress and boredom were also identified as reasons why people have made, has, has been difficult for them to make changes to their smoking behaviour. This slide here just briefly gives it an overview of people who, who smoked in relation to the, um, the diagnosis that they have. Um, as you can see, people who, with a psychotic disorder, and then with, in the analysis that we did, we grouped people with bipolar, schizophrenia, and schizoaffective as psychotic, and um, individuals, individuals on a whole with a psychotic disorder were more likely to smoke, and more likely to smoke more each day as well. And that's something that we found is consistent with a number of other studies that have looked into tobacco use. So this slide, this is, again, remembering this, we only administered the K10 and the LSP to people who are under the age of 30. So the sample there is only 120 for those. Um, as you can see, males and females, their scores, um, that is a significant difference in between um, the the rates of anxiety um, that people, anxiety and distress that people reported. So um, that was a significant difference, and over 50% of the sample had a score of above 22, which indicates high to very high levels of psychological distress. So the LSP, for those who aren't aware of it, is an assessment tool that um, workers complete on an individual, and it assesses their sort of general functioning and well-being um, and their the things that looks up, there's different categories and there's different questions, and so it looks at things about withdrawal, antisocial behaviour, compliance, and self-care. And the results here indicated to us that, on a whole, um, staff believe that individuals have relatively good levels of general functioning, which is something that are reflected in the scores in relation to the, the range that's possible. So in terms of relationships, we did a few um, correlations to see if things were in line with what we thought they would be, um, and if there's anything that stood out. And as I said before, those with a psychotic disorder are more likely to be in a moderate or high risk category for their tobacco use. Uh, we also identified um, using um, the Spearman's, Spearman's correlation analysis that high, K, high K10 scores were associated with a moderate or uh, fairly weak correlation there between K10 scores and frequency of tobacco use. High K10 scores also were more of a moderate relationship there with frequency of alcohol use and also then a, a weak correlation with caffeine use. So the more of each of those substances people used, the higher their K10 score was going to be. There was identified that there was a positive correlation between people having high scores on the K10 and subsequently high scores on the LSP, which staff rated them on. Um, again, there was some positive correlations between the frequency of alcohol use, tobacco use, and cannabis use, and problems identified related to self-care, and that was assessed by the use of the LSP-16. So, and there also were similar patterns identified in relation to the above substance use, so that alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis, in relation to the subscale of uh, any social behavior. It was interesting to note that those with an anxiety disorder consume less caffeine than those with psychotic mood or personality disorder. Um, and yeah, that's something that potentially people with an anxiety disorder are choosing not to consume as much caffeine because of the then um, impact it may have upon them. So this, this is the other aspect of the study that we did that wasn't then um, presented in the journal article, which was, it was primarily used to inform um, 
strategies within the organisation of how to better support staff and working with people who have um, coexisting issues of mental health and substance use. And what the, the Compass Audit identified for us, we did, there were 16 Compass sessions, so some um, sites were combined, and on the sites were combined, that's what Victoria didn't take part in the Compass because they'd recently done it um, just a couple of months before we uh, completed the study as part of a Victorian initiative. So we had 16 sessions across the organisation involving approximately 220 staff, and um, the, there were similar patterns across both sites and states in relation to key strengths and key areas of opportunity of how, they w how staff best work with people with a dual diagnosis. So from the administration of the, the Compass, it was found that the organisation had particular strengths in promoting access to people who may have a dual diagnosis, that the organisation didn't restrict people's access to the organisation if they did have an identified substance use issue. Um, there was a strong sort of score in relation to integrated treatment relationships, so the way in which Nimai then engaged with other services in relation to supporting people who had identified um, coexisting issues, and in relation to the way that people were exited from the service, if they had identified a substance use issue, that we then supported them to access appropriate other, other appropriate services um, for additional support. So strategic plans were developed to adjust um, some of the key recommendations <coughs> excuse me, that was identified, so to revise organisational materials that were developed in terms of resource and referral manuals, education materials, etc. Upon further developing and strengthening relationships with uh, referral agencies, um, updating staff position descriptions to reflect that staff did have uh, a component of working with people who um, had substance use issues, and identified the need for the further specific training for staff. And one of the things that was identified um, primarily out of this Compass Audit was the request for staff to complete motivational interviewing training. And since the study's been completed, the whole organisation has been taken part in that and it's now part of our routine training that's delivered to all staff. We also developed a, um, a dual diagnosis policy as a result of completing the Compass, and that has since sort of help to more formalise our um, position on, and as, yeah, as I said, that we had, didn't have, um, we never excluded someone who had um, substance use issue, but it wasn't clearly articulated anywhere. So this policy now clearly defines our approach to working with people with a dual diagnosis and um, some of the, the more formal process things related to that. One final thing that we then asked which again wasn't reported in the, the paper itself, but was something that we um, did an online survey to staff to get a sense of how important they thought the study was, because though I maybe didn't mention it before, but the primary way, the way in which we collected data for this study was supporting and training our existing um, support workers to then administer the, the assist with the consumers that they worked with. So we wanted to get a sense of <coughs> how we could um, better support them to conduct research because an aim of a further aim that I didn't mention right at the start was to build the capacity of staff to then engage in um, research activity and that would be supporting the development team and conducting um, research and ensuring that staff had a good understanding about how research informs the work that we do. And so we wanted to know from staff briefly about if they thought it was important to know about consumers, alcohol and other drug use. And as you can see, an uh, overwhelming proportion of people rated that it is important or very important to know about alcohol and other drug use. Again, very high percentage of people believe that introducing the assist provided a better opportunity to support people's recovery. And um, the, again, nearly 80% of this, uh, of, um, I think it was um, 166 staff completed the survey. And so a, a large proportion of those could see the overall benefit of conducting the study and how it would impact upon their work. So what we thought, um, just to start wrapping it up, um, how did these results compare to other studies? And what we saw is that the data on smoking rates are consistent with a lot of other studies that have been conducted on tobacco use. The numbers of people who met criteria for alcohol and cannabis use disorders 
was comparable with other studies um, in terms of the people that fell into the abuse and dependence categories. Um, but as you saw in the slides previously, people who scored um, in the abuse and dependence categories for alcohol and cannabis were fairly, cons fairly moderate in terms of the, the overall score that they could have received. It was still fairly conservative. We thought it wasn't exceptionally high. Um, the result, the rates of illicit substance use were significantly less, and as you could see previously, that um, it was almost non-existent people who were using illicit substances. substances. Um, in thinking about this, these results, it does tend to suggest that there was potentially um, under-reporting of people's substance use, and that may have been a result of the, um, the existing relationship between people, support workers conducting the interview with the people that they worked with, um, and it also, the rates identified suggest that people who did have severe substance use issues may have chosen not to engage in the study whatsoever. As you saw when I was comparing before about um, the consumption rates, in some cases were less than the general population, and so the reason we presented that was that in the number of, in the majority of cases, substance use um, is um, reported at exceptionally high levels in this population, and we thought it'd be, it's, it was very interesting to see that it was less than the general population. Um, another potential reason behind the low rates of substance use identified is the, the issues of significant long-term poverty that people experience, and the fact that people were reporting that they smoked significantly um, large amounts on a daily basis and you could see the amount of money that they were then spending upon um, tobacco. We found, yeah, so tobacco um, con and caffeine consumption was um, fairly consistent with other research. The caffeine stuff um, was fairly limited in the sense of what's being conducted in Australia. Um, a lot of that was done in inpatient facilities in the US, what, was, what I was able to uncover. So the final slide for the presentation, um, is the study, what did this then mean for NEMI as a service? Um, this study highlighted the frequency of people using legal substances at particularly harmful levels, so i.e. tobacco and caffeine. It prompted um, workers to have more formal and regular conversations about substance use with their, the consumers that they were working with, so this then became a, more of a regular feature of this support work through the emphasis the organisation had placed on this study. Again, as identified in the compass, completing the compass audit, um, it prompted staff to develop strong relationships with AOD services, <coughs> which has been done, and it's something that is an ongoing. Um, and a big thing that this study did is it raised um, some questions to us as an organisation about caffeine use, and we've since completed a study using uh, NEMI funding, which specifically looked at um, caffeine use in amongst people who were in a moderate or high risk category, so abuse or dependence category for their caffeine use. Um, we specifically explored that using a survey and um, one of the, we think it's one of the few studies that's been conducted which has had a qualitative element and we've looked specifically into people's attitudes and beliefs towards caffeine um, and the findings of that we're currently analysing and we'll plan to write up um, early next year. There was um, only slight differences, as you saw there was two different, um, the first paper reported on under 30s, the second paper reported on over 30s, or the sample as a whole, there was very slight differences between the rates of substance use between people aged 30 and under and over 30. Um, a key recommendation through the study um, findings was that for other community-based mental health agencies to then also explore the rates of substance use within their service because a lot of the times it's we were going on assumptions on a lot of other research, which was primarily drawing people from uh, clinical samples. Um, and <coughs> the ASSIST tool itself, I feel that um, may have had an, an increase or may have influenced the amount of people who fell into moderate and high risk categories for their substance use because it was influenced by um, people who had expressed a concern in the past so if we were looking at um, exactly what people, um, the frequency of their use, the rates of moderate and high substance use would have been a lot less. Um, one of the big other findings um, about the tobacco use has also since informed 
the organization's health promotion policy, and a key feature of that is has um, has been the way in which we then support people who want to make reductions to smoking. Um, and so we've got a, an increased emphasis on smoking cessation and um, healthy lifestyle and healthy activities um, that we then use, that workers are now drawing upon to support their work with consumers. Um, so just to allow enough time for some questions, um, that's my last slide. And all of you you identified in the paper, obviously the research participants themselves New South Wales Health, Mental Health Coordinating Council, Dr. Dan Lovman from Turning Point, um, who was a key uh, collaborator on the study, Merrily Cox and Antonetta Scafidi, who helped with the analysis of the data. So I'll leave that um, to, to the group to, to do some questions, I suppose. Great, thank you very much, Adam. Pleasure. That was wonderful. Um, so now we're at our question time, and we have got a few <coughs> come through during the presentation, but everyone, please feel free to continue sending through any questions that you might have for Adam. Um, firstly, uh, there was also just a comment that someone raised about getting access to the slides um, and the webinar at a later date, which Deb has answered that everyone can probably see there that they are or will be available on the... Um, Research Network's website for everyone to access later. Um, so our first other question came from Tina from NHCC, uh, which was, did the study include comparisons to national averages in Australia, which I think um, you touched on during the presentation. Yeah. So that, yeah the, the, we did look at other rates of um, not... We didn't look at any international, but yet the national averages were drawn from the, the 2010 Drug Strategy Household Survey. Did you have a look? Uh, you said there wasn't much to compare with in terms of Australia, but were the findings um, similar to what was available in terms of substance use in mental health service clients? Uh, well, there was um, one study that was conducted by um, Fowler and colleagues in Newcastle, which recruited people from... Uh, outpatient facilities and the findings um, of the, the cannabis and alcohol use were fairly consistent, but that was sort of, and the tobacco, um, but in relation to other substance use, that's where the sort of similarities primarily ended. A lot of them still reported high rates of um, amphetamine use, and we didn't get a sense of that whatsoever. Right, and that was, I mean, the next question also comes from Michael, is did anyone um, admit to using ice in um, the... Um, well... Unfortunately, as we didn't conduct the assist itself, the, the assist groups all amphetamines, including ecstasy and um, methamphetamine, into amphetamine-type stimulants. So I'm not sure exactly um, if the people did identify using ice or not. Yeah. And one of the things that you um, mentioned as well was the possibility of the under-reporting of the substance use. Yeah. How do you think you might go about, or, or people might go about rectifying that if they are asking the questions um, in a clinical setting? Um, yeah, it's a, a good question. I'm not sure if I have the answer to that. I think, um, well, it is, it is interesting because you could see that the rates of people talking about their tobacco use, people were very honest about that. And I think the, the key thing to open honest uh, disclosure is about having that strong relationship between um, workers and uh, consumers as well. So I think it's about having that strong relationship and uh, uh, reassuring people that of the reason why you're collecting this information and what it's going to be used for. I think there's a tendency for sometimes people not to disclose of fear that the information will then be passed on um, to authorities and things like that. So I think it's about having that relationship and being open and honest about that this information is being collected for this purpose to support you. Um, so that would be my thoughts about that. Yeah, and no, I think they're really good points. <laughs> I, th I guess traditionally, um, as most people who are in the audience would probably uh, attest to as well, that people have that idea that they will be excluded from a service or there will be some yeah. ramification for them in, in some way or other if they do disclose um, illicit substance use in particular. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, and then there's another question from Michael as well. Did 70% of people believe that smoking did not improve their mental health? Uh, so that was the, the remaining 70% that may have... Um, the different categories there, so it may have been uh, that they strongly disagreed or, str or disagreed or um, were neutral, so they may have fallen into different categories of that. So they all, the remaining 70% um, may not have thought that, there may have been some that were somewhere in the middle. Right, yep. So the, the question was asked on a... Um, a scale, yeah, like a scale of strongly agree or strongly disagree, yeah. And to what degree it improves their mental health? Yeah, yeah. Is there any sort of question about whether or uh, to what degree they thought it harmed their mental health? Or? Uh, yeah, there was a similar um, question about do you feel that it um, was smoking um, negatively impacts upon my mental health in a similar scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree? Um, it was um, fairly sort of consistent with that, that a, a portion of them thought that it did and a portion thought that it didn't. It wasn't, there was no significant pattern there. It was quite varied. Um. And the next question is, what practical strategies were adopted in programs to respond to the higher level of caffeine use? Uh, so that's something that is an ongoing, um, an ongoing area of work for us as an organisation, and it's uh, we've recently introduced um, a health prompt, which is supporting the staff to have discussions about people's uh, overall levels of health and um, some of the strategies that people um, have adopters, we've developed sort of tailored information sheets that have been given to staff and that they um, have the opportunity to talk to health promotion um, officers across the country who then refer to that information and something that has become a, uh, a discussion point within team meetings and a lot of um, staff themselves are working with individuals themselves to work out what's the best strategies for them. So it's not about banning people from drinking coffee or anything like that, it's about that this is a big part of people's life and um, they can still continue to drink caffeinated drinks but it's about making sure that it's done in a, in a safe way that protects their, their health. One of the things also that is linked with um, high amounts of caffeine consumption that we found in our subsequent study is a significant amount of sugar consumption as well. So, and this isn't, wasn't found in this study but the most recent study that we've done is that People were um, reported. A group of people reportedly using um, up to two liters, consuming up to two liters of soft drink per day, and then there's a whole lot of sh uh, implications related to that in terms of sugar consumption. So it's just ha framing those discussions about that caffeine can still be a part of your life, but it needs to be in a sort of frame of a healthy diet and sort of more moderated consumption instead of people drinking 10 or 15 coffees per day. Did you get any kind of sense from the study about what types of um, caffeinated drinks they were using? Like you said, the soft drinks or... Yeah. Um, so the, the, in, not in this study, but in the subsequent study that we've done, we've found um, that the primary means are uh, caffeinated soft drink and um, instant coffee. And that would sort of make sense in relation to the cost associated with those. Like we've, people are buying big five kilo tins of Nescafe and things like that. And so the main the main means of consumption are um, yeah, those, interestingly, very low people reportedly um, consuming um, energy drinks. I think the high cost associated with those is a, maybe a potential factor in that. So we ran, there's a whole range of, sub, uh, so it was tea, coffee, um, iced coffee, um, soft drink, soft drink not containing caffeine, just to get a sense of their overall diet and um, and energy drinks, and yeah, it was instant coffee was, and um, caffeine, primarily Coke was the main right. coffee choice, yeah. And um, there's another one here just linking back to um, the reporting of illicit substance use. Yeah. Right, so it, uh, which it has not been asked from Tina, but comes up <laughs> Tina. <laughs> Sorry, Tina, for dobbing you in for all these questions. Um, the, is it possible that the people getting appropriate accommodation and support are less likely to self-medicate? That's one of the things that we did think is that people who are receiving support from NEMI um, have been, um, in a lot of cases, um, been receiving support for a fairly significant amount of time and that they are fairly stable and that they're 
do they are supported in the community and that's one thing that we did think is that it is a lot of the clinical studies are reporting people their consumption rates when they're presenting um, for an admission or they're staying in an inpatient facility. So yeah, that's definitely something that we did think as well, is that people are much more stable in their life and that's impacting upon, yeah, as you said, the, the need to potentially self-medicate. Did you get um, just added on to that with uh, uh, the comment from Tina's group did mention about that you uh, discussed that there was only 42% of the people um, or a 42% response rate in the study. Yeah. Did you get any sort of idea about whether there were any systematic differences between people who were not participating in the study that may perhaps um, introduce some bias into the results? Or We did, that you say that we did ask a question about um, why if people chose not to take part or not. Um, and... There was, um, I can't find it now, but there was, the main reason that people chose not to take part is that they didn't feel their substance use was a problem, which potentially indicates that um, it is a problem and they didn't want to talk to us about it. Um, and as people would understand, a lot of people um, have a, a form or a research request overload. so that sort of burden of being able to take part in research all the time. But in looking at the, um, the demographic, we sort of tried to find out as much about the people as possible and we couldn't see a significant difference between the people that said yes and the people that said no in terms of was it a particular diagnosis, was it a particular age group, was it a particular gender. It was yep. barely based on those reasons. Yeah, people would just get sick of taking, sick of requests to take part in research. Sometimes they want to, sometimes they don't. Yep. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and there was just one other question that we have at the moment, but can everyone please feel free to send your questions in, otherwise I get to ask all of mine. Um, could you um, tell us a little bit more about the Compass study? Okay. Uh, so the Compass is, it was an American tool developed by Minkoff and Klein, and it's... Uh, it was fairly tricky to administer because it's written in very clinically um, Americanized language, and so there was a fairly um, creative way of adopting it for use with the NEMO. There is a subsequent tool that's been developed by, um, I think, the Victorian Dual Diagnosis Initiative, which does a similar thing. Um, so what it does is you have a range of, I think it's about eight or so different categories, which talks about things about access to the service, the way in which you support them, um, your relationship to other organisations, so your referrals, um, and you'll read out a, a statement and it'll say, um, NEMI is especially open to accepting people who have a dual diagnosis, and then the group would then rate on a scale of 1 to 10, so 1 strongly agree, 10 strongly disagree, and you uh, just go through all of the different categories of uh, questions, and you get an overall score of where your um, sort of skill or weaknesses lie in relation to the different categories. Um, it is a publicly available document, so if anyone's interested, they can um, have a look at that as well. It, the focus groups that we administer with the teams would, prob would range from um, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, because it would prompt a lot of discussion within the team themselves about, well, I think that we're doing this, and I think we're doing that, and you sort of had to, as a facilitator, try and get to a common understanding amongst all the, the team members. And if anyone's interested in using it, I would say use the Australian version because the, the American one is, yeah, as I said, it's written for primarily used in clinical settings. And Edith also just put up a note that um, Rob from NADA has uh, some information on the compass if anyone else Okay. information. Um, and a question from Deb. Oops, I just lost Deb's question. I can see it still. Um, yeah, have you put in place any way of monitoring the difference in outcomes for consumers since the uh, importance of addressing coexisting issues has been highlighted with staff? Um, well, I guess sort of in addition to administering the assist, so the assist is administered on a, a six monthly basis, but um, in relation to outcomes, um, the organisation still administers um, the Basis 32 and the Kansas 
on a, uh, a six monthly and 12 monthly basis. So we haven't actually done that, but that may be something that we then look at is to see the difference between people who had higher substance use scores, does that affect their levels of um, unmet need which are assessed through the, the, um, the Kansas itself. And we recently um, employed someone who now works as a reporting analyst, so that's something that um, we could then look at in a bit more detail. We haven't actually thought of that before, but it's a very good point. And um, just thinking while you were talking there, that I guess one of the other options too, with you mentioned that there was a very low rate of people um, accessing alcohol and other drug treatment currently, and you were increasing your links with services. Yeah. Might be also one of your outcomes is um, to what degree do people who are identified as having potential problems go on to seek? Yeah, exactly. And it would be useful for us to follow up and see has the the rates of people engaged with alcohol and other drug services increased? Because um, on a side note, the caffeine study that we've done, it sort of got a sense that participating in the study was an, almost an intervention in itself, that um, people administered, um, they did a questionnaire with their worker, and then they also gave consent to take part in the interview with myself and my colleague. And people who did the questionnaire and then did the interview, their behaviours had already changed in that time frame. So engaging in this study may have had raise some um, questions that people have about their own behaviour and they, they subsequently change them without having to do anything in, in particular. Yeah, it's almost like a form of brief intervention, isn't yeah, it? Exactly, exactly. Uh, another question here from Nicola is, it's interesting that there is a, a portion who believe smoking benefits their mental health. There are some studies available that also suggest that there are likely some positive effects for people who suffer schizophrenia who smoke although it clearly doesn't compensate for the health benefits of not smoking. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's still a consistent thing um, in the research about the reasons why people smoke, but there's even more research to show that if people quit smoking, then the benefits, will, the, the benefits to mental health and physical health as a whole will far outweigh what benefit they think, or benefit that uh, they're perceiving that they're receiving from smoking already. So the thing about stress relief and calming and things like that, Without smoking, um, those things wouldn't be as much of an issue. That's sort of what I've um, pieced together from looking at all this literature today. Yep. And Tina, Tina's group has also said self-reported or objective. Yeah, and that was something that we identified as a limitation in the study itself, that it was self-reported and it wasn't backed up by any objective measurements and it wouldn't be appropriate for us to conduct any formal urine screening or anything like that. So that's just something that um, we'll just have to take people's word and they may under-report or they may not be yet. As in, the, the nature of NEMI as an organisation, it's not something that we've considered as pursuing any objective measurements to back up our findings. And I think that's, I mean, it, um, from my perspective being in uh, substance use research predominantly, um, that's one of the things we always come up against it in the field is people saying but you know you only have self-reported drug use but there's yeah. abundance of literature showing that self-reported drug use when the person has n nothing to fear in disclosing yeah. really reliable and valid and in fact when you when, when you do find discrepancies between objective measures it's often not in the way that you think it's that the person self-reports that they've used but it doesn't come up in the hair or the urine or the blood that's interesting um, just, just to close off, um, I was just wondering if um, perhaps you could uh, give any more comments about, uh, like you mentioned a, uh, a lot about how this has impacted on Nemo's practice. Yeah. Think, what do you think are the implications for um, others, or that it might have for other services? Uh, well, I would, we would hope that um, it has, and I guess the. The limitation is that a lot of organisations similar to NEMO and the work that we do potentially don't have the internal resources available to conduct these pieces of research. So we are of benefit because we have a dedicated research team that fits within the service development team. So one of the, the key things that we would hope that this has influenced is that um, people aren't just taking all the reports about substance use that are widely reported and then transferring them to the people in their service. So it was about ensuring that um, as part of providing a, a comprehensive service to people engaged, 
that they would then collect this sort of information themselves because it may or may not be as much of an issue as what it was. And we didn't know about caffeine at all until we did this study. And it's, it is a, a very significant um, issue for people in relation, as I said, the link with um, diabetes relation to sugar consumption. So, yeah, I think the key thing that we hope that this contributed to the, the field of research and the organisations who provide similar services to NEMO is that it's a very important area um, to address and it's, I think it's equally important to gather as much information as possible that you can because it does have an, an impact upon people's recovery as a whole. Right. And I think one of the things you um, also demonstrated from the study is the ability to perhaps measure complex issues but using instruments that have been established that you yeah. use in a clinical setting um, in your everyday practice that are, that are quite easy and, and, and practical. Yeah, and I suppose one other thing that we thought um, is a, a finding in what that poll at the start was about is um, do people with a serious mental health want to make changes to their smoking? and the, there's always those reports that is there anything that they have that's good in their life? Is there anything that, like, let, they've got so many things that are issues, let them do that, it's the least of their concerns. But what we've demonstrated is that people do have a strong desire to make changes to their behaviour, to their smoking behaviour, and through um, smoking cessation and through active um, work between um, support workers and the people they work with, that people can make changes to their behaviour. And we've seen examples of that of people who are smoking 50 cigarettes a day and now still smoking but smoking significantly less amounts as well. So that's the misconception that people don't want to quit smoking, I suppose, is another thing that we gathered from this study as well. And there's definitely been a lot that's come out of your study. Yeah, yeah. There's more to come by the looks of it. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Well, thank you very much, Adam, and thank you to all of our participants. Um, that's been, been really helpful and please feel free to um, also follow on with any questions to myself or to Deb or um, Adam. I'm hoping you're also okay with questions coming. Sure, most definitely, yeah. Sure, that would be great. Cool, alright, thanks everyone. And thank you.